Now we're going to take a look at how we can set storage classes within our S3 buckets. So what we're going to do now is we're going to run through a demo where I will be showing you how you can create an S3 bucket, upload an object within that bucket, and set the storage class for that object in the bucket. After that, we're going to take a look at data lifecycle policies and how you can make one and set one on your objects. Okay, so let's see how we can access storage classes within S3 in our AWS. So the first thing we're gonna to have to do, of course, is we can create a bucket separate from all the buckets we already have existing because I don't want to mess over my workspaces. So what we can do is call it skill curb dash demo dash storage dash classes. That should be fine. And we can just go ahead and create this bucket. Oops, I can just call this zero. And it's just gonna create this bucket for me really quickly. Then we can go ahead and look at our storage classes. Yep, there we go. So now we can go ahead and move into our bucket. So what we have to do from here is we have to upload our files. So we can just add a file here really quickly. So say that I have these meeting notes, for example. So I'm just gonna add these meeting notes right here. So now when I have these notes, I'm gonna select that file that I uploaded and move down into properties. Now, when I go into the properties, it's gonna show me all the storage classes that I discussed previously. So we have standard, intelligent Turing, standard, infrequent access, one zone, infrequent access. And then we have two different forms of Glacier. One is instant retrieval and one is flexible retriever. And that one was actually the old Glacier, as many of you may know it. And then moving on, we have Glacier Deep Archive and Reduced Redundancy. Of course, as we discussed previously, Moving from frequency to archive access, your cost goes down. So your standard would cost the most, your intelligent tiering would cost a little less, and moving on, so on, so forth, all the way down to here, which would be the cheapest. There's other factors in play as well when it comes to cost. So you have minimum billable object size within a bunch of them. You have the monitoring fees, which only applies to intelligent tiering because that's the one that's actually looking at your objects to see how frequently they're being accessed. And then you have retrieval fees because when you have to get things out of an archive, it tends to be quite the process and it's a little costly. So they tend to charge you per GB. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to set our object up with intelligent tiering. So that way we can even look at data life cycles. So with that, now that we've set it up, we can just go ahead and upload it. And once it's uploaded, it's a really small file, 272 bytes, yep, it's uploaded and that's done. And now we have our file here. So let's go back to our bucket. When we come back to our bucket now, we can go over into our properties and now we can see that we have intelligent tiering archive configurations. We're gonna use this today to set up a configuration that allows us to move our meeting notes into archives as time moves on. So we want to move our notes after a set amount of time into archive access. And then after that, we want to move it into a deeper archive access after another set amount of time. So we can go ahead and create a configuration here and we can call it my configuration one. Why not? We can give it the prefix skill curb. And as we move down, now we have these two archive rule actions that we discussed in our data lifecycle policy section, where we have archive access tier and deep archive access tier. So there's, a, there's small descriptions associated with both of these. So let's read them out. When enabled, intelligent tiering will automatically move objects that haven't been accessed for a minimum of 90 days to the archive access tier. So that means that if you have not touched your meeting notes for 90 days, AWS is going to assume, okay, you don't want to use this frequently. You're not going to use it. So I'm going to move this into an archive access tier because it's cheaper to keep it there. So we're just going to check that. And then we have to set the number of days until the transition is made to the archive access tier. So the minimum number you can put here is 90 days. And it says so at the bottom here. So the whole number greater than or equal to 90 and up to 730 days. So we're just going to set this at 90. Now, say we wanted to move our meeting notes deeper into the deep archive. So to do that, we also have to select this one here. Now, in deep, deep archive, the whole number has to be greater than or equals to 180 days. And 180 days would apply at the same time 
as archive access tier. So when you've moved into archive access tier and you've set your deep archive to 180 days, now it's another 90 days of not accessing those meeting notes until those are moved into your deep archive access tier. So now we want to set this value at the minimum available, which is 180. So I'm just going to set this at 180 and I'm just going to create this configuration. There we go. So now we have a configuration made ready to go. And as you can see here, days until transition to archive access, 90 days, days until transition to deep archive access here, 180 days. And with this, we've sort of explored the storage classes available within Amazon S3. And we've also seen how intelligent tiering works and how data lifecycle can be managed and created.